Section two of the Ingoldsby Legends First Series This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ingoldsby Legends First Series by Richard Harris Barham Section two The Spectre of Tappington It is very odd though what can have become of them said charles seaforth as he peeped under the valance of an old-fashioned bedstead in an old-fashioned apartment of a still more old-fashioned manor-house tis confoundedly odd and i can't make it out at all why barney where are they and where the devil are you no answer was returned to this appeal and the lieutenant who was in the main a reasonable person at least as reasonable a person as any young gentleman of twenty-two in the service can fairly be expected to be cooled when he reflected that his servant could scarcely reply extempore to a summons which it was impossible he should hear an application to the bell was the considerate result and the footsteps of as tight a lad as ever put pipe clay to belt sounded along the gallery come in said his master an ineffectual attempt upon the door reminded mr seaforth that he had locked himself in by heaven this is the oddest thing of all said he as he turned the key and admitted mr maguire into his dormitory barney where are my pantaloons is it the breeches asked the valet casting an inquiring eye round the apartment is it the breeches sir yes what have you done with them sure then your honour had them on when you went to bed and it's hereabout they'll be i'll be bail and barney lifted a fashionable tunic from a cane-backed armchair proceeding in his examination but the search was vain there was the tunic aforesaid there was a smart-looking kerseymere waistcoat but the most important article of all in a gentleman's wardrobe was still wanting where can they be asked the master with a strong accent on the auxiliary verb sorrow a no i knows said the man it must have been the devil then after all who has been here and carried them off cried seaforth staring full into barney's face mr maguire was not devoid of the superstition of his countrymen still he looked as if he did not quite subscribe to the sequitur his master read incredulity in his countenance why i tell you barney i put them there on that armchair when i got into bed and by heaven i distinctly saw the ghost of the old fellow they told me of come in at midnight put on my pantaloons and walk away with them maybe so was the cautious reply i thought of course it was a dream but then where the devil are the breeches the question was more easily asked than answered barney renewed his search while the lieutenant folded his arms and leaning against the toilet sunk into a reverie after all it must be some trick of my laughter-loving cousins said seaforth ah then the ladies chimed in mr maguire though the observation was not addressed to him and will it be miss caroline or miss fanny that stole your honour's things i hardly know what to think of it pursued the bereaved lieutenant still speaking in soliloquy with his eye resting dubiously on the chamber door i locked myself in that's certain and but there must be some other entrance to the room pooh i remember the private staircase how could i be such a fool and he crossed the chamber to where a low oaken doorcase was dimly visible in a distant corner he paused before it nothing now interfered to screen it from observation but it bore tokens of having been at some earlier period concealed by tapestry remains of which yet clothed the walls on either side the portal this way they must have come said seaforth i wish with all my heart i had caught them ach the kittens sighed mr barney maguire but the mystery was yet as far from being solved as before true there was the other door but then 
that too on examination was even more firmly secured than the one which opened on the gallery two heavy bolts on the inside effectually prevented any coup de main on the lieutenant's bivouac from that quarter he was more puzzled than ever nor did the minutest inspection of the walls and floor throw any light upon the subject one thing only was clear the breeches were gone it is very singular said the lieutenant tappington generally called tapton everard is an antiquated but commodious manor-house in the eastern division of the county of kent a former proprietor had been high sheriff in the days of elizabeth and many a dark and dismal tradition was yet extant of the licentiousness of his life and the enormity of his offences the glen which the keeper's daughter was seen to enter but never known to quit still frowns darkly as of yore while an ineradicable blood-stain on the oaken stair yet bids defiance to the united energies of soap and sand but it is with one particular apartment that a deed of more especial atrocity is said to be connected a stranger guest so runs the legend arrived unexpectedly at the mansion of the bad sir giles they met in apparent friendship but the ill-concealed scowl on the master's brow told the domestics that the visit was not a welcome one the banquet however was not spared the wine-cup circulated freely too freely perhaps for sounds of discord at length reached the ears of even the excluded serving-men as they were doing their best to imitate their betters in the lower hall alarmed some of them ventured to approach the parlour one an old and favoured retainer of the house went so far as to break in upon his master's privacy sir giles already high in oath fiercely enjoined his absence and he retired not however before he had distinctly heard from the stranger's lips a menace that there was that within his pocket which could disprove the knight's right to issue that or any other command within the walls of tapton the intrusion though momentary seemed to have produced a beneficial effect the voices of the disputants fell and the conversation was carried on thenceforth in a more subdued tone till as evening closed in the domestics when summoned to attend with lights found not only cordiality restored but that a still deeper carouse was meditated fresh stoops and from the choicest bins were produced nor was it till at a late or rather early hour that the revellers sought their chambers the one allotted to the stranger occupied the first floor of the eastern angle of the building and had once been the favourite apartment of sir giles himself scandal ascribed this preference to the facility which a private staircase communicating with the grounds had afforded him in the old knight's time of following his wicked courses unchecked by parental observation a consideration which ceased to be of weight when the death of his father left him uncontrolled master of his estate and actions from that period sir giles had established himself in what were called the state apartments and the oaken chamber was rarely tenanted save on occasions of extraordinary festivity or when the yule log drew an unusually large accession of guests around the christmas hearth on this eventful night it was prepared for the unknown visitor who sought his couch heated and inflamed from his midnight orgies and in the morning was found in his bed a swollen and blackened corpse no marks of violence appeared upon the body but the livid hue of the lips and certain dark-coloured spots visible on the skin aroused suspicions which those who entertained them were too timid to express 
apoplexy induced by the excesses of the preceding night sir giles confidential leech pronounced to be the cause of his sudden dissolution the body was buried in peace and though some shook their heads as they witnessed the haste with which the funeral rites were hurried on none ventured to murmur other events arose to distract the attention of the retainers men's minds became occupied by the stirring politics of the day while the near approach of that formidable armada so vainly arrogating to itself a title which the very elements joined with human valour to disprove soon interfered to weaken if not obliterate all remembrance of the nameless stranger who had died within the walls of tapton everard years rolled on the bad sir giles had himself long since gone to his account the last as it was believed of his immediate line though a few of the older tenants were sometimes heard to speak of an elder brother who had disappeared in early life and never inherited the estate rumours too of his having left a son in foreign lands were at one time rife but they died away nothing occurring to support them the property passed unchallenged to a collateral branch of the family and the secret if secret there were was buried in denton churchyard in the lonely grave of the mysterious stranger one circumstance alone occurred after a long intervening period to revive the memory of these transactions some workmen employed in grubbing an old plantation for the purpose of raising on its site a modern shrubbery dug up in the execution of their task the mildewed remnants of what seemed to have been once a garment on more minute inspection enough remained of silken slashes and a coarse embroidery to identify the relics as having once formed part of a pair of trunk hose while a few papers which fell from them altogether illegible from damp and age were by the unlearned rustics conveyed to the then owner of the estate whether the squire was more successful in deciphering them was never known he certainly never alluded to their contents and little would have been thought of the matter but for the inconvenient memory of one old woman who declared she heard her grandfather say that when the stranger guest was poisoned though all the rest of his clothes were there his breeches the supposed repository of the supposed documents could never be found the master of tapton everard smiled when he heard dame jones hint of deeds which might impeach the validity of his own title in favour of some unknown descendant of some unknown heir and the story was rarely alluded to save by one or two miracle mongers who had heard that others had seen the ghost of old sir giles in his nightcap issue from the postern enter the adjoining copse and wring his shadowy hands in agony as he seemed to search vainly for something hidden among the evergreens the stranger's death-room had of course been occasionally haunted from the time of his decease but the periods of visitation had latterly become very rare even mrs botherby the housekeeper being forced to admit that during her long sojourn at the manor she had never met with anything worse than herself though as the old lady afterwards added upon more mature reflection i must say i think i saw the devil once such was the legend attached to tapton everard and such the story which the lively caroline ingoldsby detailed to her equally mercurial cousin charles seaforth lieutenant in the honourable east india company's second regiment of bombay fencibles 
as arm in arm they promenaded a gallery decked with some dozen grim-looking ancestral portraits and among others with that of the redoubted sir giles himself the gallant commander had that very morning paid his first visit to the house of his maternal uncle after an absence of several years passed with his regiment on the arid plains of hindostan whence he was now returned on a three years furlough he had gone out a boy he returned a man but the impression made upon his youthful fancy by his favourite cousin remained unimpaired and to tapton he directed his steps even before he sought the home of his widowed mother comforting himself in this breach of filial decorum by the reflection that as the manor was so little out of his way it would be unkind to pass as it were the door of his relatives without just looking in for a few hours but he found his uncle as hospitable and his cousin more charming than ever and the looks of one and the requests of the other soon precluded the possibility of refusing to lengthen the few hours into a few days though the house was at the moment full of visitors the peterses were there from ramsgate and mr mrs and the two miss simpkinsons from bath had come to pass a month with the family and tom ingoldsby had brought down his college friend the hon augustus sucklethumpkin with his groom and pointers to take a fortnight's shooting and then there was mrs ogleton the rich young widow with her large black eyes who people did say was setting her cap at the young squire though mrs botherby did not believe it and above all there was mademoiselle pauline her femme de chambre who mon dieu'd everything and everybody and cried quelle horreur at mrs botherby's cap in short to use the last named and much respected lady's own expression the house was choke full to the very attics all save the oaken chamber which as the lieutenant expressed a most magnanimous disregard of ghosts was forthwith appropriated to his particular accommodation mr maguire meanwhile was fain to share the apartment of oliver dobbs the squire's own man a jocular proposal of joint occupancy having been first indignantly rejected by mademoiselle though preferred with the laced taste in life of mr barney's most insinuating brogue come charles the urn is absolutely getting cold your breakfast will be quite spoiled what can have made you so idle such was the morning salutation of miss ingoldsby to the militaire as he entered the breakfast-room half an hour after the latest of the party a pretty gentleman truly to make an appointment with chimed in miss frances what is become of our ramble to the rocks before breakfast oh the young men never think of keeping a promise now said mrs peters a little ferret-faced woman with underdone eyes when i was a young man said mr peters i remember i always made a point of pray how long ago was that asked mr simpkinson from bath why sir when i married mrs peters i was let me see i was do pray hold your tongue p and eat your breakfast interrupted his better half who had a mortal horror of chronological references it's very rude to tease people with your family affairs the lieutenant had by this time taken his seat in silence a good-humoured nod and a glance half smiling half inquisitive being the extent of his salutation smitten as he was and in the immediate presence of her who had made so large a hole in his heart his manner was evidently distrait which the fair caroline in her secret soul attributed to his being solely occupied by her agrément 
how would she have bridled had she known that they only shared his meditations with a pair of breeches charles drank his coffee and spiked some half-dozen eggs darting occasionally a penetrating glance at the ladies in hope of detecting the supposed waggery by the evidence of some furtive smile or conscious look but in vain not a dimple moved indicative of roguery nor did the slightest elevation of eyebrow rise confirmative of his suspicions hints and insinuations passed unheeded more particular inquiries were out of the question the subject was unapproachable in the meantime patent cords were just the thing for a morning's ride and breakfast ended away cantered the party over the downs till every faculty absorbed by the beauties animate and inanimate which surrounded him lieutenant seaforth of the bombay fencibles bestowed no more thought upon his breeches than if he had been born on the top of ben lomond another night had passed away the sun rose brilliantly forming with his level beams a splendid rainbow in the far-off west whither the heavy cloud which for the last two hours had been pouring its waters on the earth was now flying before him ah then and it's little good it'll be the claning of ye apostrophized mr barney maguire as he deposited in front of his master's toilet a pair of brand new jockey boots one of hobie's primest fits which the lieutenant had purchased in his way through town on that very morning had they come for the first time under the valet's depurating hand so little soiled indeed from the turfy ride of the preceding day that a less scrupulous domestic might perhaps have considered the application of warren's matchless or oxalic acid altogether superfluous not so barney with the nicest care had he removed the slightest impurity from each polished surface and there they stood rejoicing in their sable radiance no wonder a pang shot across mr maguire's breast as he thought on the work now cut out for them so different from the light labours of the day before no wonder he murmured with a sigh as the scarce dried window-panes disclosed a road now inch deep in mud ah then it's little good the claning of ye for well had he learned in the hall below that eight miles of a stiff clay soil lay between the manor and bolsover abbey whose picturesque ruins like ancient rome majestic in decay the party had determined to explore the master had already commenced dressing and the man was fitting straps upon a light pair of crane-necked spurs when his hand was arrested by the old question barney where are the breeches they were nowhere to be found mr seaforth descended that morning whip in hand and equipped in a handsome green riding frock but no breeches and boots to match were there loose jean trousers surmounting a pair of diminutive wellingtons embraced somewhat incongruously his nether man vicey the patent cords returned like yesterday's pantaloons absent without leave the top boots had a holiday a fine morning after the rain said mr simpkinson from bath just the thing for the ops said mr peters i remember when i was a boy do hold your tongue p said mrs peters advice which that exemplary matron was in the constant habit of administering to her p as she called him whenever he prepared to vent his reminiscences her precise reason for this it would be difficult to determine unless indeed the story be true which a little bird had whispered into mrs botherby's ear mr peters though now a wealthy man 
had received a liberal education at a charity school and was apt to recur to the days of his muffin cap and leathers as usual he took his wife's hint in good part and paused in his reply a glorious day for the ruins said young ingoldsby but charles what the deuce are you about you don't mean to ride through our lanes in such toggery as that lassie me said miss julia simpkinson won't you be very wet you had better take tom's cab quoth the squire but this proposition was at once overruled mrs ogleton had already nailed the cab a vehicle of all others the best adapted for a snug flirtation or drive miss julia in the phaeton no that was the post of mr peters who indifferent as an equestrian had acquired some fame as a whip while travelling through the midland counties for the firm of bagshaw snivelby and grimes thank you i shall ride with my cousin said charles with as much nonchalance as he could assume and he did so mr ingoldsby mrs peters mr simpkinson from bath and his eldest daughter with her album following in the family coach the gentleman commoner voted the affair damn slow and declined the party altogether in favour of the gamekeeper and a cigar there was no fun in looking at old houses mrs simpkinson preferred a short sejour in the still-room with mrs botherby who had promised to initiate her in that grand arcanum the transmutation of gooseberry jam into guava jelly did you ever see an old abbey before mr peters yes miss a french one we have got one at ramsgate he teaches the miss joneses to parlez-vous and is turned of sixty miss simpkinson closed her album with an air of ineffable disdain mr simpkinson from bath was a professed antiquary and one of the first water he was master of gwillem's heraldry and mill's history of the crusades knew every plate in the monasticon had written an essay on the origin and dignity of the office of overseer and settled the date of a queen anne's farthing an influential member of the antiquarian society to whose beauties of bagnick wells he had been a liberal subscriber procured him a seat at the board of that learned body since which happy epoch sylvanus urban had not a more indefatigable correspondent his inaugural essay on the president's cocked hat was considered a miracle of erudition and his account of the earliest application of gilding to gingerbread a masterpiece of antiquarian research his eldest daughter was of a kindred spirit if her father's mantle had not fallen upon her it was only because he had not thrown it off himself she had caught hold of its tail however while it yet hung upon his honoured shoulders to souls so congenial what a sight was the magnificent ruin of bolsover its broken arches its mouldering pinnacles and the airy tracery of its half-demolished windows the party were in raptures mr simpkinson began to meditate an essay and his daughter an ode even seaforth as he gazed on these lonely relics of the olden time was betrayed into a momentary forgetfulness of his love and losses the widow's eyeglass turned from her chichis beo's whiskers to the mantling ivy mrs peters wiped her spectacles and her pea supposed the central tower had once been the county jail the squire was a philosopher and had been there often before so he ordered out the cold tongue and chickens bolsover priory said mr simpkinson with the air of a connoisseur bolsover priory was founded in the reign of henry the sixth about the beginning of the eleventh century hugh de bolsover had accompanied that monarch to the holy land 
in the expedition undertaken by way of penance for the murder of his young nephews in the tower upon the dissolution of the monasteries the veteran was enfeoffed with the lands and manor to which he gave his own name of bolsover or bealsover by corruption bolsover a b in chief over three owls all proper being the armorial ensigns borne by this distinguished crusader at the siege of acre ah that was sir sidney smith said mr peters i've heard tell of him and all about mrs partington and p be quiet and don't expose yourself sharply interrupted his lady p was silenced and betook himself to the bottled stout these lands continued the antiquary were held in grand sergeantry by the presentation of three white owls and a pot of honey lassie me how nice said miss julia mr peters licked his lips pray give me leave my dear owls and honey whenever the king should come a rat-catching in this part of the country rat-catching ejaculated the squire pausing abruptly in the mastication of a drumstick to be sure my dear sir don't you remember the rats once came under the forest laws a minor species of venison rats and mice and such small deer eh shakespeare you know our ancestors ate rats the nasty fellows shuddered miss julia in a parenthesis and owls you know are capital mousers i've seen a howl said mr peters there's one in the sohological gardens a little hook-nosed chap in a wig only its feathers and poor p was destined never to finish a speech do be quiet cried the authoritative voice and the would-be naturalist shrank into his shell like a snail in the sohological gardens you should read blunt's jocular tenures mr ingoldsby pursued simpkinson a learned man was blunt why sir his royal highness the duke of york once paid a silver horseshoe to lord ferrers i've heard of him broke in the incorrigible peters he was hanged at the old bailey in a silk rope for shooting dr johnson the antiquary vouchsafed no knowledge of the interruption but taking a pinch of snuff continued his harangue a silver horseshoe sir which is due from every scion of royalty who rides across one of his manors and if you look into the penny county histories now publishing by an eminent friend of mine you will find that langhale in county norfolk was held by one baldwin per saltum sufflatum et petum that is he was to come every christmas into westminster hall there to take a leap cry hem and mr simpkinson a glass of sherry cried tom ingoldsby hastily not any thank you sir this baldwin surnamed le mrs ogleton challenges you sir she insists upon it said tom still more rapidly at the same time filling a glass and forcing it on the savant who thus arrested in the very crisis of his narrative received and swallowed the potation as if it had been physic what on earth has miss simpkinson discovered there continued tom something of interest see how fast she is writing the diversion was effectual every one looked towards miss simpkinson who far too ethereal for creature comforts was seated apart on the dilapidated remains of an altar tomb committing eagerly to paper something that had strongly impressed her the air the eye in a fine frenzy rolling all betokened that the divine afflatus was come her father rose and stole silently towards her what an old bore muttered young ingoldsby alluding perhaps to a slice of brawn which he had just begun to operate upon but which from the celerity with which it disappeared did not seem so very difficult of mastication but what had become of seaforth 
and his fair Caroline all this while. Why, it so happened that they had been simultaneously stricken with the picturesque appearance of one of those high and pointed arches which that eminent antiquary, Mr. Horsley Curtis, has described in his ancient records as a Gothic window of the Saxon order. And then the ivy clustered so thickly and so beautifully on the other side, that they went round to look at that, and then their proximity deprived it of half its effect, and so they walked across to a little knoll a hundred yards off, and in crossing a small ravine they came to what in Ireland they call a bad step, and Charles had to carry his cousin over it, and then, when they had come back, she would not give him the trouble again for the world, so they followed a better but more circuitous route, and there were hedges and ditches in the way, and stiles to get over, and gates to get through, so that an hour or more had elapsed before they were able to rejoin the party. "'Lassie me,' said Miss Julia Simpkinson, "'how long you have been gone!' and so they had. The remark was a very just as well as a very natural one. They were gone a long while, and a nice cosy chat they had. And what do you think it was all about, my dear miss? Oh, lassie me! Love, no doubt, and the moon, and eyes, and nightingales, and— Stay, stay, my sweet young lady. Do not let the fervour of your feelings run away with you. I do not pretend to say, indeed, that one or more of these pretty subjects might not have been introduced, but the most important and leading topic of the conference was Lieutenant Seaforth's breeches. Caroline, said Charles, I have had some very odd dreams since I have been at Tappington. Dreams, have you? smiled the young lady, arching her taper neck like a swan in pluming dreams have you ay dreams or dream perhaps i should say for though repeated it was still the same and what do you imagine was its subject it is impossible for me to divine said the tongue i have not the least difficulty in guessing said the eye as plainly as ever i spoke i dreamt of your great-grandfather there was a change in the glance. My great-grandfather? Yes, the old Sir Giles, or Sir John, you told me about the other day. He walked into my bedroom in his short cloak of murray-coloured velvet, his long rapier, and his Raleigh-looking hat and feather, just as the picture represents him, but with one exception. And what was that? Why, his lower extremities, which were visible, were those of a skeleton. Well, well, after taking a turn or two about the room, and looking round him with a wistful air, he came to the bed's foot, stared at me in a manner impossible to describe, and then he, he laid hold of my pantaloons, whipped his long bony legs into them in a twinkling, and strutting up to the glass, seemed to view himself in it with great complacency. I tried to speak, but in vain. The effort, however, seemed to excite his attention, for wheeling about, he showed me the grimmest-looking death's head you can well imagine, and with an indescribable grin, strutted out of the room. Absurd, Charles! How can you talk such nonsense? But Caroline, the breeches are really gone. End of section two. The Inglesby Legends First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Inglesby Legends First Series by Richard Harris Barham. Section three. On the following morning, contrary to his usual custom, Seaforth was the first person in the breakfast parlour. As no one else was present, 
he did precisely what nine young men out of ten so situated would have done he walked up to the mantelpiece established himself upon the rug and subducting his coat-tails one under each arm turned towards the fire that portion of the human frame which it is considered equally indecorous to present to a friend or an enemy a serious not to say anxious expression was visible upon his good-humoured countenance and his mouth was fast buttoning itself up for an incipient whistle when little flo a tiny spaniel of the blenheim breed the pet object of miss julia simpkinson's affections bounced out from beneath a sofa and began to bark at his pantaloons they were cleverly built of a light grey mixture a broad stripe of the most vivid scarlet traversing each seam in a perpendicular direction from hip to ankle in short the regimental costume of the royal bombay fencibles the animal educated in the country had never seen such a pair of breeches in her life omne ignotum pro magnifico the scarlet streak inflamed as it was by the reflection of the fire seemed to act on flora's nerves as the same colour does on those of bulls and turkeys she advanced at the pas de charge and her vociferation like her amazement was unbounded a sound kick from the disgusted officer changed its character and induced a retreat at the very moment when the mistress of the pugnacious quadruped entered to the rescue lassie me flo what is the matter cried the sympathizing lady with a scrutinizing glance levelled at the gentleman it might as well have lighted on a feather bed his air of imperturbable unconsciousness defied examination and as he would not and flora could not expound that injured individual was compelled to pocket up her wrongs others of the household soon dropped in and clustered round the board dedicated to the most sociable of meals the urn was paraded hissing hot and the cups which cheer but not inebriate steamed redolent of hyson and pico muffins and marmalade newspapers and finnan haddies left little room for observation on the character of charles warlike turnout at length a look from caroline followed by a smile that nearly ripened to a titter caused him to turn abruptly and address his neighbour it was miss simpkinson who deeply engaged in sipping her tea and turning over her album like a female chrononotomphologus immersed in cogibundity of cogitation an interrogatory on the subject of her studies drew from her the confession that she was at that moment employed in putting the finishing touches to a poem inspired by the romantic shades of bolsover the entreaties of the company were of course urgent mr peters who liked verses was especially persevering and sappho at length compliant after a preparatory hem and a glance at the mirror to ascertain that her look was sufficiently sentimental the poetess began there is a calm a holy feeling vulgar minds can never know or the bosom softly stealing chastened grief delicious woe oh how sweet at eve regaining yon lone tower's sequestered shade sadly mute and uncomplaining yow 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 yelled a hapless sufferer from beneath the table it was an unlucky hour for quadrupeds and if every dog will have his day he could not have selected a more unpropitious one than this mrs ogleton too had a pet a favourite pug whose squab figure black muzzle and tortuosity of tail that curled like a head of celery in a salad bowl 
bespoke his Dutch extraction. Yow, 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 continued the brute, a chorus in which Flo instantly joined. Sooth to say, Pug had more reason to express his dissatisfaction than was given him by the muse of Simpkinson. The other only barked for company. Scarcely had the poetess got through her first stanza when Tom Inglesby, in the enthusiasm of the moment, became so lost in the material world that in his abstraction he unwarily laid his hand on the cock of the urn. Quivering with emotion, he gave it such an unlucky twist that the full stream of its scalding contents descended on the gingerbread hide of the unlucky Cupid. The confusion was complete, the whole economy of the table disarranged. The company broke up in most admired disorder, and vulgar minds will never know anything more of Miss Simpkinson's ode till they peruse it in some forthcoming annual. Seaforth profited by the confusion to take the delinquent who had caused this stramash by the arm and to lead him to the lawn, where he had a word or two for his private ear. The conference between the young gentlemen was neither brief in its duration, nor unimportant in its result. The subject was what the lawyers call tripartite, embracing the information that Charles Seaforth was over head and ears in love with Tom Inglesby's sister, secondly that the lady had referred him to papa for his sanction thirdly and lastly his nightly visitations and consequent bereavement at the two first items tom smiled auspiciously at the last he burst out into an absolute guffaw steal your breeches miss bailey over again by jove shouted ingoldsby but a gentleman you say and Sir Giles, too. I am not sure, Charles, whether I ought not to call you out for aspersing the honour of the family. Laugh as you will, Tom. Be as incredulous as you please. One fact is incontestable. The breeches are gone. Look here, I am reduced to my regimentals, and if these go, to-morrow I must borrow of you. Rochefoucauld says, there is something in the misfortunes of our very best friends that does not displease us. Assuredly we can, most of us, laugh at their petty inconveniences, till called upon to supply them. Tom composed his features on the instant, and replied with more gravity, as well as with an expletive, which, if my lord mayor had been within hearing, might have cost him five shillings. There is something very queer in this, after all. The clothes, you say, have positively disappeared. Somebody is playing you a trick, and ten to one, your servant has a hand in it. By the way, I heard something yesterday of his kicking up a bobbery in the kitchen, and seeing a ghost or something of that kind himself. Depend upon it, Barney is in the plot." It now struck the lieutenant at once that the usually buoyant spirits of his attendant had of late been materially sobered down, his loquacity obviously circumscribed, and that he, the said lieutenant, had actually rung his bell three several times that very morning before he could produce his attendance. Mr. Maguire was forthwith summoned, and underwent a close examination. The bobbery was easily explained. Mr. Oliver Dobbs had hinted his disapprobation of a flirtation carrying on between the gentleman from Munster and the lady from the Rue Saint-Honoré. Mademoiselle had boxed Mr. Maguire's ears, and Mr. Maguire had pulled Mademoiselle upon his knee, and the lady had not cried, Mon Dieu! and Mr. Oliver Dobbs said it was very wrong, and Mrs. Botherby said it was scandalous, and what ought not to be done in any moral kitchen, and Mr. Maguire had got hold of the Honourable Augustus Sucklethumbkin's powder-flask, 
and had put large pinches of the best double dartford into mr dobbs tobacco-box and mr dobbs pipe had exploded and set fire to mrs botherby's sunday cap and mr maguire had put it out with the slop basin barring the wig and then they were all so cantankerous that barney had gone to take a walk in the garden and then then mr barney had seen a ghost a what you blockhead asked tom ingoldsby sure then and it's meself will tell your honour the rights of it said the ghost seer meself and miss pauline sir or miss pauline and meself for the ladies come first anyhow we got tired of the hopstropolis scrimmaging among the old servants that didn't know a joke when they seen one and we went out to look at the comet that's the rory bory alehouse they calls him in this country and we walked upon the lawn and divil if any alehouse there was there at all and miss pauline said it was be case of the shrubbery maybe and why wouldn't we see it better beyond the trees and so we went to the trees but sorrow a comet did meself see there barring a big ghost instead of it a ghost and what sort of a ghost barney ah then divil a lie i'll tell your honour a tall old gentleman he was all in white with a shovel on the shoulder of him and a big torch in his fist though what he wanted with that it's meself can't tell for his eyes were like gig lamps let alone the moon in the comet which wasn't there at all and barney says he to me cause why he knew me barney says he what is it you're doing with the colleen there barney divil a word did i say miss pauline screeched and cried murther in french and ran off with herself and of course meself was in a mighty hurry after the lady and had no time to stop palavering with him anyway so i dispersed at once and the ghost vanished in a flame of fire mr maguire's account was received with avowed incredulity by both gentlemen but barney stuck to his text with unflinching pertinacity a reference to mademoiselle was suggested but abandoned as neither party had a taste for delicate investigations i'll tell you what seaforth said ingoldsby after barney had received his dismissal that there is a trick here is evident and barney's vision may possibly be a part of it whether he is most knave or fool you best know at all events i will sit up with you to-night and see if i can convert my ancestor into a visiting acquaintance meanwhile your finger on your lip twas now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and graves give up their dead gladly would i grace my tale with decent horror and therefore i do beseech the gentle reader to believe that if all the succedania to this mysterious narrative are not in strict keeping he will ascribe it only to the disgraceful innovations of modern degeneracy upon the sober and dignified habits of our ancestors i can introduce him it is true into an old and high-roofed chamber its walls covered on three sides with black oak wainscoting adorned with carvings of fruit and flowers long anterior to those of grinling gibbons the fourth side is clothed with a curious remnant of dingy tapestry once elucidatory of some scriptural history but of which not even mrs botherby could determine mr simpkinson who had examined it carefully inclined to believe the principal figure to be either bathsheba or daniel in the lion's den while tom ingoldsby decided in favour of the king of bashan all however was conjecture tradition being silent on the subject a lofty arched portal led into and a little arched portal led out of this apartment they were opposite each other 
and each possessed the security of massy bolts on its interior. The bedstead, too, was not one of yesterday, but manifestly coeval with days ere Seddon's was, and when a good four-post article was deemed worthy of being a royal bequest. The bed itself, with all the appurtenances of palliasse, mattresses, etc., was of far later date, and looked most incongruously comfortable. The casements, too, with their little diamond-shaped panes and iron binding, had given way to the modern heterodoxy of the sash window. Nor was this all that conspired to ruin the costume, and render the room a meet haunt for such mixed spirits, only as could condescend to don at the same time an Elizabethan doublet and Bond Street inexpressibles. With their green Morocco slippers on a modern fender, in front of a disgracefully modern grate, sat two young gentlemen, clad in shawl-patterned dressing gowns and black silk stocks, much at variance with the high cane-backed chairs which supported them. A bunch of abomination, called a cigar, reeked in the left-hand corner of the mouth of one, and in the right-hand corner of the mouth of the other, an arrangement happily adapted for the escape of the noxious fumes up the chimney, without that unmerciful funking other which a less scientific disposition of the weed would have induced. A small Pembroke table filled up the intervening space between them, sustaining at each extremity an elbow and a glass of toddy. Thus in lonely pensive contemplation were the two worthies occupied, when the iron tongue of midnight had told twelve. Ghost times come, said Inglesby taking from his waistcoat pocket a watch like a gold half-crown, and consulting it as though he suspected the turret clock over the stables of mendacity. Hush, said Charles, did I not hear a footstep? There was a pause. There was a footstep. It sounded distinctly. It reached the door. It hesitated, stopped, and passed on. Tom darted across the room, threw open the door, and became aware of Mrs. Botherby toddling to her chamber at the other end of the gallery, after dosing one of the housemaids with an approved julep from the Countess of Kent's choice manual. "'Good night, sir,' said Mrs. Botherby. "'Go to the devil,' said the disappointed ghost-hunter. An hour, two, rolled on and still no spectral visitation, nor did aught intervene to make night hideous, and when the turret clock sounded at length the hour of three, Ingoldsby, whose patience and grog were alike exhausted, sprang from his chair, saying, This is all infernal nonsense, my good fellow. Deuce of any ghost shall we see to-night. It's long past the canonical hour. I'm off to bed, and as to your breeches, I'll insure them for the next twenty-four hours at least, at the price of the buckram. Certainly. Oh, thank ye, to be sure, stammered Charles, rousing himself from a reverie which had degenerated into an absolute snooze. Good night, my boy. Bolt the door behind me, and defy the Pope, the Devil, and the Pretender. Seaforth followed his friend's advice, and the next morning came down to breakfast, dressed in the habiliments of the preceding day. The charm was broken, the demon defeated. The light greys with the red stripe down the seams were yet in rerum natura, and adorned the person of their lawful proprietor. Tom felicitated himself and his partner of the watch on the result of their vigilance. But there is a rustic adage, which warns us against self-gradulation before we are quite out of the wood. Seaforth was yet within its verge. A rap at Tom Ingoldsby's door the following morning startled him as he was shaving. He cut his chin. 
come in and be damned to you said the martyr pressing his thumb on the scarified epidermis the door opened and exhibited mr barney maguire well barney what is it quoth the sufferer adopting the vernacular of his visitant the master sir well what does he want the loanst of a breeches plays your honour why you don't mean to tell me by heaven this is too good shouted tom bursting into a fit of uncontrollable laughter why barney you don't mean to say the ghost has got them again mr maguire did not respond to the young squire's risibility the cast of his countenance was decidedly serious faith then it's gone they are sure enough hasn't meself been looking over the bed and under the bed and in the bed for the matter of that and divil a hayperth of breeches is there to the fore at all i'm bothered entirely hark ye mr barney said tom incautiously removing his thumb and letting a crimson stream incarnadine the multitudinous lather that plastered his throat this may be all very well with your master but you don't humbug me sir tell me instantly what have you done with the clothes this abrupt transition from lively to severe certainly took maguire by surprise and he seemed for an instant as much disconcerted as it is possible to disconcert an irish gentleman's gentleman me is it meself then that's the ghost to your honour's thinking said he after a moment's pause and with a slight shade of indignation in his tones is it i would stale the master's things and what would i do with them that you best know what your purpose is i can't guess for i don't think you mean to stale them as you call it but that you are concerned in their disappearance i am satisfied confound this blood give me a towel barney maguire acquitted himself of the commission as i've a sowl your honour said he solemnly little it is meself knows of the matter and after what i seen what you've seen why what have you seen barney i don't want to inquire into your flirtations but don't suppose you can palm off your saucer eyes and gig lamps upon me then as sure as your honour's standing there i saw him and why wouldn't i when miss pauline was to the fore as well as meself and get along with your nonsense leave the room sir but the master said barney imploringly and without a breeches sure he'll be catching cowld take that rascal replied ingoldsby throwing a pair of pantaloons at rather than to him but don't suppose sir you shall carry on your tricks here with impunity recollect there is such a thing as a treadmill and that my father is a county magistrate barney's eye flashed fire he stood erect and was about to speak but mastering himself not without an effort he took up the garment and left the room as perpendicular as a quaker ingoldsby said charles seaforth after breakfast this is now past a joke to-day is the last of my stay for notwithstanding the ties which detain me common decency obliges me to visit home after so long an absence i shall come to an immediate explanation with your father on the subject nearest my heart and depart while i have a change of dress left on his answer will my return depend in the meantime tell me candidly i ask it in all seriousness and as a friend am i not a dupe to your well-known propensity to hoaxing have you not a hand in no by heaven seaforth i see what you mean on my honour i am as much mystified as yourself and if your servant not he if there be a trick he at least is not privy to it if there be a trick why charles do you think i know not what to think tom as surely as you are a living man 
so surely did that spectral anatomy visit my room again last night grin in my face and walk away with my trousers nor was i able to spring from my bed or break the chain which seemed to bind me to my pillow see forth said ingoldsby after a short pause i will but hush here are the girls and my father i will carry off the females and leave you a clear field with the governor carry your point with him and we will talk about your breeches afterwards tom's diversion was successful he carried off the ladies en masse to look at a remarkable specimen of the class dodocandria monogynia which they could not find while seaforth marched boldly up to the encounter and carried the governor's outworks by a coup de main i do not stop to describe the progress of the attack suffice it that it was as successful as could have been wished and that seaforth was referred back again to the lady the happy lover was off at a tangent the botanical party was soon overtaken and the arm of caroline whom a vain endeavour to spell out the linnaean name of a daffy down dilly had detained a little in the rear of the others was soon firmly locked in his own what was the world to them its noise its nonsense and its breeches all seaforth was in the seventh heaven he retired to his room that night as happy as if no such thing as a goblin had ever been heard of and personal chattels were as well fenced in by law as real property not so tom ingoldsby the mystery for mystery there evidently was had not only piqued his curiosity but ruffled his temper the watch of the previous night had been unsuccessful probably because it was undisguised to-night he would ensconce himself not indeed behind the arras for the little that remained was as we have seen nailed to the wall but in a small closet which opened from one corner of the room and by leaving the door ajar would give to its occupant a view of all that might pass in the apartment here did the young ghost-hunter take up a position with a good stout sapling under his arm a full half-hour before seaforth retired for the night not even his friend did he let into his confidence fully determined that if his plan did not succeed the failure should be attributed to himself alone at the usual hour of separation for the night tom saw from his concealment the lieutenant enter his room and after taking a few turns in it with an expression so joyous as to betoken that his thoughts were mainly occupied by his approaching happiness proceed slowly to disrobe himself the coat the waistcoat the black silk stock were gradually discarded the green morocco slippers were kicked off and then ay and then his countenance grew grave it seemed to occur to him all at once that this was his last stake nay that the very breeches he had on were not his own that to-morrow morning was his last and that if he lost them a glance showed that his mind was made up he replaced the single button he had just subducted and threw himself upon the bed in a state of transition half chrysalis half grub wearily did tom ingoldsby watch the sleeper by the flickering light of the night lamp till the clock striking one induced him to increase the narrow opening which he had left for the purpose of observation the motion slight as it was seemed to attract charles's attention for he raised himself suddenly to a sitting posture listened for a moment and then stood upright upon the floor ingoldsby was on the point of discovering himself when the light flashing full upon his friend's countenance he perceived that though his eyes were open their sense was shut that he was yet under the influence of sleep 
Seaforth advanced slowly to the toilet, lit his candle at the lamp that stood on it, then going back to the bed's foot, appeared to search eagerly for something which he could not find. For a few moments he seemed restless and uneasy, walking round the apartment and examining the chairs, till coming fully in front of a large swing-glass that flanked the dressing-table, he paused as if contemplating his figure in it. He now returned towards the bed, put on his slippers, and with cautious and stealthy steps proceeded towards the little arched doorway that opened on the private staircase. As he drew the bolt, Tom Ingoldsby emerged from his hiding place, but the sleepwalker heard him not. He proceeded softly downstairs, followed at a due distance by his friend, opened the door which led out upon the gardens, and stood at once among the thickest of the shrubs which there clustered round the base of a corner turret, and screened the postern from common observation. At this moment Ingoldsby had nearly spoiled all by making a false step. The sound attracted Seaforth's attention. He paused and turned, and as the full moon shed her light directly upon the pale and troubled features, Tom marked, almost with dismay, the fixed and rayless appearance of his eyes. There was no speculation in those orbs that he did glare withal. The perfect stillness preserved by his follower seemed to reassure him. He turned aside, and from the midst of a thick-set laurestinus drew forth a gardener's spade shouldering which he proceeded with greater rapidity into the midst of the shrubbery arrived at a certain point where the earth seemed to have been recently disturbed he set himself heartily to the task of digging till having thrown up several shovelfuls of mould he stopped flung down his tool and very composedly began to disencumber himself of his pantaloons up to this moment Tom had watched him with a wary eye. He now advanced cautiously, and as his friend was busily engaged in disentangling himself from his garment, made himself master of the spade. Seaforth, meanwhile, had accomplished his purpose. He stood for a moment with his streamers waving in the wind, occupied in carefully rolling up the small clothes into as compact a form as possible, and all heedless of the breath of heaven, which might certainly be supposed at such a moment, and in such a plight, to visit his frame too roughly. He was in the act of stooping low to deposit the pantaloons in the grave which he had been digging for them, when Tom Ingoldsby came close behind him, and with a flat side of the spade. The shock was effectual. Never again was Lieutenant Seaforth known to act the part of a somnambulist. One by one his breeches, his trousers, his pantaloons, his silk net tights, his patent cords, his showy greys with the broad red stripe of the Bombay fencibles were brought to light rescued from the grave in which they had been buried, like the strata of a Christmas pie, and after having been well aired by Mrs. Botherby, became once again effective. The family, the ladies especially, laughed. The Peterses laughed. The Simpkinsons laughed. Barney Maguire cried, Botheration! And Mademoiselle Pauline, Mon Dieu! Charles Seaforth, unable to face the quizzing which awaited him on all sides, started off two hours earlier than he had proposed. He soon returned, however, and having, at his father-in-law's request, given up the occupation of rajah hunting and shooting nabobs, led his blushing bride to the altar. Mr. Simpkinson from Bath did not attend the ceremony being engaged at the grand junction meeting of savans 
then aggregating from all parts of the known world in the city of Dublin. His essay, demonstrating that the globe is a great custard, whipped into coagulation by whirlwinds and cooked by electricity, a little too much baked in the Isle of Portland, and a thought underdone about the bog of Allen, was highly spoken of, and narrowly escaped obtaining a Bridgewater prize. Miss Simpkinson and her sister acted as bridesmaids on the occasion. The former wrote an epithalamium, and the latter cried, Lassie me, at the clergyman's wig. Some years have since rolled on, the union has been crowned with two or three tidy little offshoots from the family tree, of whom Master Neddy is Grandpapa's darling, and Marianne, Mamma's particular sock. I shall only add that Mr. and Mrs. Seaforth are living together quite as happily as two good-hearted, good-tempered bodies, very fond of each other, can possibly do and that since the day of his marriage Charles has shown no disposition to jump out of bed or ramble out of doors o' nights, though from his entire devotion to every wish and whim of his young wife, Tom insinuates that the fair Caroline does still occasionally take advantage of it so far as to slip on the breeches. End of section 3